So uh, thank you for coming to the afternoon session on, on Arab constitutionalism, and I will turn uh, the proceedings over to uh, my colleague and friend Kevin Davis, who will um, introduce the panel and the panelists. Thank you very much, Sujit. Uh, so this is a fascinating panel to be moderating or presiding over. It's a historic moment, as you all know. Uh, it's really quite unprecedented to have so many countries, so many societies facing uh, constitutional transitions that all happen to be in, located in such a, an important area for the world as, uh, as a whole. So I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. I think <coughs> I'll do that one by one. They're going to speak individually, uh, so I'll, I'll introduce them, uh, each one, before they uh, uh, begin their remarks. So I'll begin with uh, Professor Clark Lombardi, who is an associate professor of law at the University of Washington, as well as being an adjunct uh, associate pre pre professor in international studies. He is a specialist, of course, in Islamic law, and in especially Islamic constitutional law, and is probably best known for his book on state law as Islamic law in modern Egypt. Uh, in addition to his scholarly activities, he's been heavily involved in uh, policy work in a number of countries in the Muslim world, including Iraq and Afghanistan. So uh, we look forward to hearing uh, from him on both the, on insights that he's gained from both his work as a scholar and more recently as uh, someone out in the field. So with that, uh, Professor Lombardi. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can't even, I promised my, this panelist I would go in alphabetical order and then immediately started speaking about the first person I was looking at uh, for no good reason. Uh, we can do that uh, since I've given the introduction, but then we'll go to Mohammed for that. All right. Uh, the, the paper that I, I gave uh, it focuses on the phenomenon of constitutional provisions that are interpreted and understood to require that all state law conform to Islamic law or Sharia principles. And these clauses are uh, have come to be the focus of, of considerable scholarly attention, but they're also the focus of an enormous amount of attention among policymakers and journalists. Just the other day, there was a, an article in the New York Times which discussed at great length how important it was that Tunisia would not inc include this kind of provision in its constitution. And there is a sense, uh, certainly in many of these journalistic articles, but also when I talk to policymakers, that these clauses have a uniform interpretation, that they, that they mean something, one particular thing, and therefore, whether they're included in the Constitution or whether they're not included in the Constitution is by itself an extremely important decision. In the paper that I gave, uh, which is a bit of a picaresque, it, it wanders around into all sorts of different things, and I... And I I regret that and wish that it had focused a little more um, on the following point, because I think this is the most important point. Uh, the inclusion of these clauses by itself is not, in fact, the only important question. It may not even be the most important question. These clauses have a, a long and rich history. They uh, come out of an unwritten constitutional principle that was accepted and largely followed in many Muslim empires in the pre-modern era, stretching into the modern era. And this principle was initially constitutionalized, then for reasons that I talk about in the paper, stopped being constitutionalized, but reappeared in the second half of the 20th century at a time when Muslims disagreed deeply about what the implications of this kind of clause would be. And what this means is that the inclusion of the clause could mean any number of different things in the minds of the Muslim populations that adopted them. And because it could mean any number of different things, the important question became not so much whether the clause exists or even how the clause is worded, something else that people sometimes focus on, but what are the institutional mechanisms that are created to interpret and apply this kind of clause? And if you look at the history of the Muslim world and Muslim constitutions, particularly in the, in the second half of the 20th century, moving into the 21st, 
You actually see this type of clause appearing quite regularly, but in very, very different types of institutional setting. And the types of differences may involve whether or not the clause is justiciable at all. The clause is often written into a constitution but is not considered to be justiciable either by a court or by a clerical institution. If it is justiciable, then the question that, um, that people debated and you get different answers in different places is whether it should be a court that interprets the clause or whether it should be a clerical institution or some other special institution or, as I talk about in the paper, some form of hybrid in which a group of clerics interprets it subject to override by a political institution. And then if you do have, and, and this leads me to my third point, then there's the question of whether the decision by a counter-majoritarian body, either a court or a clerical institution, should be subject to democratic override. And different countries around the, um, around the world, and really throughout the Muslim world, have experimented with various forms of, um, and various combinations of organization, each with different answers to these different questions. And looking at that, I focus on a couple of countries to point out the advantages and disadvantages of doing the, of taking these different approaches. And one thing that I do try to stress is that the choice that a country has is large, but it's not entirely unconstrained. There are in certain societies, in Muslim societies, certain assumptions, for example, about religious authority, and they're different in different um, Muslim societies. So that, for example, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, or in the Islamic Republic of Iran, there is an assumption about clerical authority, about the, the preferability of having specially trained professional clerics interpret Islamic law that does not exist, in fact, in a country like Egypt, which is where I did much of my research. In that type of society, clerics are going to have to have some sort of role. What this means is, A, the clause cannot be non-justiciable, and when it is justiciable, clerics are going to have to play some role in judging compliance with this kind of clause. On the other hand, the Muslim world seems to be coming to believe that there is an enormous advantage to having the input of democratic society weighing in, even in societies where clerical, um, uh, where clerical authority is, uh, uh, tends to be respected. What this means, this, this, this general trend around the Muslim world to trying to get the public's view as to how Islam should be interpreted, grows out of the collapse of consensus in the Muslim world, particularly in the Sunni Muslim world, but really everywhere, about exactly what it is that Islam requires. We need to understand that const these provisions that require the state to conform to Sharia norms are almost universally understood to apply a principle not that the state should apply a specific body of rules, but merely that it should be checked against a fairly open-ended set of principles. And different Muslims interpret what these principles are in different ways. They may respect clerical interpretation of the principles up to a point, but they're going to want to have some say in it. Therefore, the intriguing thing is that both Saudi Arabia and Iran have created political overrides to clerical interpretation, which is something that's underappreciated in the world. Although in Iran, the first body that will decide whether or not the state is complying with its Sharia um, with its Sharia provision is a clerical institution. If the parliament is upset by a ruling against some of its, legislat its legislation, it can refer this to a political body that's designed to inter reinterpret the situation and ask whether, looking to a principle that uh, exists in Shia Islamic legal theory, whether the public interest requires the law to be applied irrespective of the fact that it seems on its face to contradict certain principles. In the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it's slightly different. The Constitution allows and indeed requires courts not to enforce rulings that are contrary to Sharia in the mind of the judge. On the other hand, that decision is binding only in the case before it, doesn't void the legislation, and the law remains on the books to be tested again by another judge. So what this does is creates enormous political pressure 
on the king to change the, legis to change the legislation and creates a mode of dialogic discourse about what Sharia requires without, in fact, letting the clerical rule be binding in a final sense in the system. Now, with that in mind, I ask the following question. In countries like Egypt or other countries that are going through constitutional reform during the Arab Spring, what should they be thinking about as they think about these Sharia supremacy clauses? I assume in this paper that the majority of countries that are drafting constitutions will include these. Now, it is true that Tunisia is not going to include one explicitly, although in, in, I'm, I'm happy to discuss in the comments why I think, in fact, the provision that makes Islam the official religion of the state may do effectively the same thing. But in any case, I think that in most countries, even if not in Tunisia, you're going to see these provisions in the Constitution. And what I urge people to do in my paper is to think now very hard about creating a constitutional design that will make that work effectively and in a way that's consistent with all the other commitments of the Constitution. The odds are that these will be constitutions that not only require the state to respect Sharia principles, but that also require the state to, to, to respect a number of substantively liberal rights provisions and, and provisions for procedural democracy. If that's true, what kind of institutions should we be creating that will allow the substantively liberal provisions to be realized in some recognizable form alongside the Islamization provision. And I make a couple of points. One of them is that no provision will be useful or effective if it's considered to be, um, if it's considered to vest interpretation in a group of people who are not considered to have authority. Quite simply, this kind of provision can only be effective even to, even effective in tolerating liberalism if people respect the institution that has been vested with the power to interpret it. And that becomes very important. Now what I suggest is that the history of um, both Islamic intellectual history and Islamic uh, and Muslim states political histories suggests that non-justiciable provisions may be one way to do this very effectively. If you are trying to get majority buy-in for an interpretation of Islamic law, allowing the majority to determine which interpretation they prefer is in fact a way to get buy-in. So to the, extent that that is, um, to the extent that that's permissible in a country, it should at least be explored. If this is not true, then I ask the question whether the institution should be, um, whether you should have a special tribunal decide the question of Sharia compliance or whether you should have the regular constitutional court resolve it. And as I point out, this may be resolved simply by social assumptions about authority in Iran or in, um, or in Saudi Arabia, it is uh, unimaginable that people who didn't have clerical training would, um, resolve a, uh, would, would resolve, at least in the first instance, the question of Islamic interpretation. And therefore, in those countries, a, a special body has to be created of clerics to resolve the issue. <clears throat> but in the vast majority of cases, I believe that it makes far more sense for a whole range of reasons to have the same institution in one sitting resolve both the question of Sharia compliance and compliance with liberal provisions. And I, I argue that for a couple of reasons. One of them is simple efficiency. Having two bodies um, looking at the same law creates a degree of uncertainty um, and also waste of time that can be quite damaging. You also have the possibility of institutional struggle between two groups. So it's more effective from that perspective. Um, and then I also argue that when the same, the same body looks at laws um, from two perspectives, it is more likely to come up with an effective theory that will harmonize the two. So it's both um, more likely to be efficient and it's more likely to do a good job if that's possible. The last question I, I then ask is, assuming that you do have a special body, should there be um, political override? And I suggest that there should be. So that even if you, you choose not to go the route of non-justiciability, then you should create some form of democratic political override of a decision um, that a rule is contrary to Islamic provisions, largely because if we look at history, we see that that is feasible and it gives us some of the advantages of non-justiciability while still allowing for the sense that there's been expert review. Now, the last point that I, I put into there, and I think it's worth thinking about, although it's not um, prescriptive for constitutional designers, is simply this. We we often 
contrast, and when I say we, maybe because I don't put myself or actually anyone on this panel um, in that category, but people often contrast liberal rights provisions from Islamization provisions. And they often contrast them not only because they believe they lead to substantively different outcomes, but because they believe they're functionally different. That rights is a contested, is an area where we talk about contested norms, and these Islamization provisions deal with a rigid body of laws. In fact, Islamic intellectual history and Muslim political history tells us that that's not true. In many ways, at least in form, these are much more similar to each other than we realize. Rights provisions are contested and Islamization provisions are contested. And we should start to think about whether the debates that people have had about how rights provisions should be institutional design questions to figure out who should be deciding questions of rights in a society whether this be the arguments of Jeremy Waldron against his critics, whether the insights that they have may help us understand better some of the challenges and some of the things we should be doing when dealing with the interpretation of Islamization provisions. And if we do think about it in those terms, then we're more likely, and when I say we, this will be the people who are drafting these constitutions themselves, will be more likely to come up with institutions that will be able effectively to come up with theories of constitutionalism that harmonize both their rights provisions and their Islamization provision. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, uh, with apologies again, uh, we turn to Professor Mohamed Fadel, who teaches at the University of Toronto. He, um, he, he has a doctorate, actually, in Near, Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, um, focusing on Islamic law uh, and legal history, uh, and he's published extensively in that field, but he's also a fully qualified lawyer and practiced for a while right here in New York, actually, as a corporate lawyer, and has written um, in the areas that I'm uh, most familiar with, with uh, on, on, the, uh, on Islamic commercial law, among other things. So Islamic family law, Islamic commercial law, and of course, uh, most recently, um, and what you'll hear about today, the general roles, role of Islam in the legal system, in this case of Egypt. Uh, so, Professor Fidel. Thank you, Kevin. Um, is this on? Is this on? No. No. Yeah. It is? It is? Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to be speaking today about the role of... Uh, no? Okay, there we go. Is that better? Okay. I'm going to be speaking today about the role of Islamic law in the Egyptian legal system. Um, not so much from a substantive perspective, but again from an institutional perspective, um, this time from the view of judicial culture. And I want to contrast the idea of uh, a common law approach to Islamic law versus a statutory approach to Islamic law, and why it might make a difference for uh, the legitimacy of that body of law within um, a Muslim jurisdiction, in this case, Egypt. Um, now, why this is important in the context of, of constitutional transitions is I think Egypt has been plagued by the question of the le legitimacy of its modern legal system for the last hundred years. Um, to give a very brief overview of that history, um, up until the first half of the 19th century, Egyptian law was largely in the hands of, of clerical specialists who specialized in an unwritten, uh, or let me better put it, an uncodified version of Islamic law. It was developed uh, through a long centuries, long centuries tradition of, uh, of scholarly interpretation, commentary, and writing. Although the secular authorities controlled the court system, they inevitably appointed as judges members of this clerical establishment. And so you could speak of a, a division of powers, so to speak, in the pre-modern uh, Islamic constitution, as this in Egypt, where you had uh, secular executives uh, who staffed their courts with, ex with, with experts who were trained in a law that derived itself from religious uh, claims of legitimacy, right? Um, now, these are the, uh, in themselves, I would, it's a larger argument, but just because they had a religious claim to le legitimacy does not mean that the law that they were applying in and of itself should be viewed as religious. Uh, Sharia, 
which is what we now call Islamic law in the pre-modern world, refer to a, a vast range of, 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 of disciplines, not only intellectual disciplines, but also um, sort of uh, moral habits and moral hab hab habituation. Um, it didn't become narrowly uh, focused on law probably until the early part of the 20th century as legal reforms were being made. Now, why is it that Muslim states like Egypt and the Ottoman Empire and Tunisia uh, began <clears throat> a shift away from what I call pre-modern Islamic law to statutory uh, code law imported largely from Europe? It was largely a question of efficiency. Um, they rightly perceived themselves as being vulnerable to colonial uh, intervention, if not outright imperialism. And as part of the reform, the 19th century reform movement known as the Tanzimat, the New Order, um, political elites of the 19th, Muslim political elites of the 19th century thought that it made sense to adopt European codes uh, and instead of, or in place of, traditional Islamic law, largely because of uh, the increased ability it gave elites to control societies, right? So it wasn't a question of adopting these uh, uh, modern, modern legislation in order to effectuate um, liberalizing reforms or democ democratizing re reforms. These were instrumentalizing reforms. Uh, adoption of modern law was considered a tool of modernization, creating more effective administration, uh, better governance. Now, the problem with that was, of course, it introduced a radically new conception of legality. Instead of having rules um, come out of the scholarly tradition of discussion, debate, and justification, now rules were being adopted simply by decree of the executive. Pre-modern Islamic law um, contemplated executive lawmaking, or we could say more generally secular lawmaking. Um, and it wasn't that secular lawmaking ipso facto was illegitimate. It's just that in the history, in the historical tradition of Islamic states, secular lawmaking was largely intermittent, episodic, and certainly not systematic. It existed to supplement uh, the law that the jurist uh, developed, and it was largely limited to areas of administration, international relations, etc. So when the Ottomans and their, uh, their uh, representatives in various provinces began to import these comprehensive codes. It looked like they were doing something that was competing first com in competition with traditional Islamic law and then finally excluding it, which in fact was the result when they introduced their own, the, the, the new courts uh, and, 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 and the al-Mahakim and nizamiya the secular, the secular courts, which eventually displaced all the traditional Islamic courts except in the area of family law. Now in so doing, of course, uh, as I said, there was a sharp rupture with uh, the pre-modern legal culture. I think uh, what was surprising, at least in Egypt, was not that uh, there was a reaction to this, but the source of the reaction. One might have predicted that it would have been the traditionalist clerical class that led, uh, a, re led a resistance or argued for the reintroduction uh, or Islamization of the norms of what I'm calling state law, right? So first time about pre-modern Islamic law, it's substitute, it's, it's replaced by state law imported from Europe. And now I want to talk about uh, the modern, or the, the, the synthesis between them, uh, which I call um, Islamic state law. In other words, state law promulgated by uh, the secular branches of government, but purports to be uh, Islamically legitimate. How does this come about? It doesn't come about through um, the work of the clerics. It comes about through the work of lawyers who are ostensibly part of the secular regime. And the most important figure in this regard is uh, a, a, a early 20th century, well, not that early, I mean, a 20th century Egyptian jurist named Abdel Razak al Sanhuri. Al Sanhuri was a legal an Egyptian legal scholar of comparative law who wrote extensively not only on pre-modern Islamic law, but also on the civil law and the common law. He wrote two dissertations. Um, 
uh, one on a modernized version of the caliphate, short, written shortly after uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I, and the other was a very technical uh, uh, dissertation on the law of competition in the common law, right? or un unfair competition, excuse me. In any case, um, Sanhuri viewed the reintroduction of Islamic law from a nationalist lens. He thought that Egypt could not become a truly independent uh, state unless it liberated itself from uh, the vestiges of colonialism. One of those vestiges was legal colonialism in the form of Egypt's uh, hasty adaptation, adaptation of the Code Napoleon at the end of the last quarter of the 19th century. Right? So he saw in Islamic law uh, the tools or the resources that would allow Egypt to develop its own indigenous legal culture. Sanhuri, uh, being a professional lawyer, right, was not interested in reintroducing the system of pre-modern Islamic law, but what he did want to do was appropriate it in order to create a civil law that was, uh, in his words, Egyptian. And because it was Egyptian, because the legal history and legal culture of Egypt was Islamic, it would necessarily have to be Islamic. Now, I don't want to get into the details of how he went about drafting his civil code, but the important thing is he made the claim explicitly that his civil code was an Islamic civil code, right? And in the hierarchy of sources for the interpretation of the code, he introduces the idea that in the absence of an express provision in the code dealing with the case, the judge is to apply the most uh, apply uh, a rule of Islamic law. So the Egyptian civil code, which goes into effect in 1949, is officially, ideologically, uh, an Islamic code. Even though if you just look at it, you might not realize uh, it doesn't strike out and jump at you and say, hi, I'm Islamic. Right? But according to the drafter and according to the, uh, the instructions of interpretation and applications given to the judges, it makes the claim uh, to incorporate Islamic law. Now, um, the other important aspect in Egyptian law is Article 2, which I think has, we've made references to it throughout this day. But I think, and uh, I, I might not remember the exact dates of things here, but uh, first Sadat, uh, introduced this amendment, I think in 1971, which made the Sharia a source of legislation uh, in, the Egyptian, in, in Egyptian law. And then Mubarak sort of increased the ante in 1985 or something like that, making it the, making the principles of Islamic law the principal source of Egyptian legislation. So one could say that the two most important artifacts of the Egyptian legal system, its civil code and its constitution, make express claims to being Islamic, right? And so now we have a phenomenon of what I call Islamic state law. What does that mean? What does it mean for a state law to be Islamic? And under what circumstances can it be considered legitimacy? Legitimate, excuse me. Now one of the interesting points or things that um, uh, scholars have pointed to, most notably the gentleman sitting to my left, Clark Lombardi in his book on um, Islamic law, state law in Egypt, he points out that Despite the vast learning of Sanhuri and his vast erudition and his, um, you know, his uh, extensive scholarly output, many people continue to question the Islamic bona fides of the civil code. Right? Despite the fact that you're in a multi-volume commentary, not only on the code, but also a general treatise um, in which he uh, uh, you know, theorizes on the sources uh, of basically trying to reconcile civil law principles and Islamic law principles. Um, now, and, and then, so on the one hand, the, Islam, the, Islamic, the civil code suffers this Islamic legitimacy deficit, one might say. On the other hand, Article 2, even though it seems to have a lot less teeth to it, right, it just says the principles of, the, of, of uh, Islamic law shall be uh, the source of all legislation in Egypt, right, so it's sort of very vague in general, and um, even though the Supreme Constitutional Court of Egypt, in construing that provision, hasn't exactly been, um, to put it crudely, a fundamentalist kind of court adopting very conservative interpretations of what Article 2 means. Despite that, 
right? Despite that, and despite the fact that the Supreme Court's decisions could be viewed as very result-oriented, ad hoc, and not systematic, the exact opposite of Sanhuri. So, you know, as lawyers, we like to think systematic reasoning is great, ad hoc, sub, uh, results-oriented reasoning is bad. Despite that, the Article II decisions seem to have a lot more Islamic legitimacy in contemporary Egypt than, uh, than the Sanhuri Code. And this seems to me a puzzle. Now, the reason why I think, or well, the answer to this puzzle, I think, lies in a particular feature of Islamic legality, which has to do less with its substance than its culture. You can speak of a law as having a culture. And I think the pre-modern pre Islamic legal culture was a lot more similar to the common law legal culture in that Muslim jurists in the pre-modern era were accustomed uh, or conditioned to be reason-giving jurists. In other words, they were conditioned, it was part of their legal culture, to give more or less elaborate legal justifications for the answers posed to them. Right? So you could look, think of it as a much more of a case law kind of system. When Egypt began legal modernization, however, it adopted a much more statutory civil code system, and culminating in the civil code with the idea that the civil code is comprehensive, self-referential, right, and uh, its own kind of authority. Right? So the civil code culture and the judges uh, that are reared on that kind of culture aren't used to engaging in the kinds of arguments that were considered uh, the sin qua non of legitimate legal argumentation in Islamic legal culture and still remains true if you were to go to a seminary and they discuss Islamic law, they present a series of basically argumentative techniques, rhetorical techniques, what kinds of arguments count and what don't, right? So I think there's a, kind, there's, a, there's a problem in the structure of civil code when it interacts with Islamic legitimacy. Because Islamic legitimacy is much more inherently discursive than simply top-down uh, positivist. But the Egyptian legal culture, at least in the, in the in application of the civil code, is very much of a positively legalist culture. Therefore, the decisions of the Supreme Constitutional Court can enjoy a much greater degree of legitimacy, not because people agree with the outcomes, but because in rhetoric and in structure, it's like a common law court. It gives reasoned discussions of the issues, it justifies its arguments, and it listens to both sides. In other words, it's, a, it's engaged in a kind of dialogical uh, conversation with different groups in Egypt about what Islamic law means in the contemporary world, specifically when exercised through, the, the, uh, through public institutions. So um, I think the lesson to be drawn from this is that if Egypt is serious about being an Islamic having Islamic State law, then the judicial culture needs to be reformed in such a way so it becomes more like common law culture rather than civil law culture. And so that judges take statutes and even the civil code itself to be more, a law, to be more like the starting point of a conversation than being self-referential um, uh, 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 decision mechanisms. Now, what would this mean? Right? Well, what I want to try to say here is it would make a big difference, I think, to the outcome, practical outcomes of, 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 of litigation if judges in Egypt viewed statutes uh, from a common law perspective rather than a civil law perspective. Right? So I want to give a couple of examples here. Um, if we go back to one of the earliest family law reforms in Egypt, Egypt tried to, it, most of the history of Egypt's family law reforms have been moving away from strict Hanafi rules, which were very harsh on women, toward adopting more liberal rules from the Maliki school. So one example is, is expanding the grounds of divorce. Under Hanafi law, um, women basically could not get a divorce from their husband on grounds of abuse. Right? That was not a ground for judicial divorce. However, Maliki law did permit a woman to get judicial divorce if abuse was proven. So in the 1920s, one of the first things the Egyptian parliament did was adopt the Maliki substantive rule, permitting divorce on, the, on, the, on, on proof of harm. Now the problem here was the Hanafis, because they never recognized the substantive theory of harm, they obviously did not have a procedural rule that was appropriate to proving 
spousal harm, right? The Malikis, on the other hand, because they had a substantive theory of harm, they had a particular, uh, they had a relaxed standard of proof to prove that claim, right? So the Malikis allowed a woman to prove a claim of harm, right, through hearsay and through other kinds of uh, circumstantial evidence. The Egyptian parliament, however, when they did the reform, only adopted the substantive Maliki rule. They did not apply, did not adopt the procedural Maliki rule. As a result, the reform was virtually a dead letter because Egyptian judges continued to apply the Hanafi standard of proof. So it became impossible or virtually impossible for Egyptian women to obtain divorces because courts continued to require direct evidence of abuse, which is almost impossible to obtain. Right? Now, if they had applied, if they had understood this reform from a common law perspective, so to speak, they could view this as a statutory oversight. They could use background principles of Islamic law to fill in the gaps and further the remedial purposes of the statute. Okay. Um, another example, again, from family law is the Khul'a law of 2000. The Khul'a law of 2000 was it, uh, purported to give, it, didn't purport, it gave Egyptian women the right to an effective divorce immediately, more or less immediately, upon return of their dower to their husbands, right? Um, now there's a problem with khula, as it's called in, in Islamic law, namely that a woman who is being abused or mistreated by her husband is morally and legally entitled to a divorce without paying compensation, right? And so pre-modern Islamic law developed different norms to deal with the problem that they call the strong-armed woman. The woman who was not in a position to prove that her husband was an abuser, and so instead paid him to get out of the marriage when she was in fact entitled to a judicial divorce. Now the problem with the Egyptian statute of 2000 is it creates a bifurcated decision uh, tree for the woman. Either she proceeds under the theory of she's being abused, in which case she has to, <laughs> she has to suffer uh, the consequences of Egypt's notoriously slow-moving wheels of justice, or she can forego her claims of abuse and get an immediate divorce but give up her property rights. So again, here in this case, if Egyptian judges could, would interpret the statute from a common law perspective, they could adopt the Maliki rule that says women who are being strong-armed by their husband, in other words, who are subject to abuse but can't prove it, can go ahead and agree to pay them in exchange for an immediate divorce, but then sue ex post to recover the money, right? Um, so the, the, one of the points here is that uh, it's very important not only from perspective of the legitimacy of the legal system that a more dialogical method of Islamic law be introduced, but in fact, it's also the case that a deeper engagement with substantive rules of pre-modern Islamic law can actually do a better job in furthering the goals of, the, of, of parliament. And I just want to conclude on this one last point, and this is one of the things that I think is more disappointing or to me about the present politics in Egypt is that unlike, let's say, the 20s, when you had liberal figures like Senhuri who were very uh, learned in Islamic law and could make, uh, uh, you know, um, I guess, very uh, profound interpretations and understandings of Islamic law, I don't see that in today's generation of, of, of liberal leaders. And so when the issue of Islamic law comes up, I think there's more a problem of paralysis and an inability to understand how they can use it to further their own agenda than was the case 80 years ago. And I think that it really behooves them to learn the lessons of the 1919 generation. Thank you. So our final panelist is Professor Chibli Malat, who is the, uh, now the presidential professor at S.J. Quinney School of Law, uh, College of Law at the University of Utah. Uh, he also holds the Jean Manet Chair at St. Joseph's University in Lebanon and has had teaching positions and research positions at a number of institutions around the world. Uh, he's a very prominent commentator on a variety of issues relating to law in the Islamic world. 
and has litigated uh, cases from time to time. And as you've seen in the program, he also is the chairman of an NGO called the Right to Nonviolence, uh, uh, which is, he may speak about uh, in his remarks as well. So with that, uh, Professor Alap. Thank you, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be at this uh, founding moment, especially since I'm going to talk about another founding moment, uh, that is, um, the constitutional moment which is upon us in the Middle East. So let me put it uh, slightly in context. First, I'm speaking with uh, a dual hat which actually makes it far easier uh, to consider a number of, uh, of issues than, uh, than the mere academic hat. Uh, I am an activist in a sense, a human rights activist, a uh, constitutional activist. Uh, certainly, I like to see myself on the side of the revolution. Uh, and unlike many of you, I'm not shy about it. Uh, not only do I think that it's important uh, to be part of it, it's a privilege to be a part of something so extraordinary as what happened in 2011 in the Middle East, but I contend that being part of it makes it often easier to understand it than, um, than looking at it from the more uh, supposedly scientific uh, academic lens. <coughs> Now, this uh, short talk is then part of trying to understand what this revolution is all about, and indeed understand it as, um, as an actor uh, would understand it. And so uh, it's part of a little project that goes with the right to nonviolence work that, for instance, uh, saw me and colleagues talking about how international law can help the Syrians against the regime uh, in, recent, uh, in recent days, or in a, an article to be published, I think, in a couple of days, about whether there is uh, a way to bring Palestine into uh, the Middle East nonviolent revolution uh, um, by means that, uh, that will be developed in that short opening. So this um, puts a context of relativity and contextuality to my remarks. And I think it's particularly important for, uh, for the ambitions of, uh, of what you are embarking upon, uh, Professor Chowdhury, uh, that this contextualization bears a particular uh, theoretical reflection uh, that goes beyond we don't want to intervene because we're outsider and we're advisors, or you know, we should uh, step in because it's very important for all of us. Um, so the first part of this manifesto is to try to understand why hundreds of thousands in Yemenis go down in the street asking for the removal of their president dictator uh, with an absolute clear conscience that they should do it nonviolently. So this motto of the Middle East Revolution, as I call it, uh, the nonviolence dimension has been the first big question mark of my search for, as it were, uh, the soul or the spirit of uh, what the Middle East has embarked upon uh, in 2011. Um, I'm not going to talk about this today, except to say that it has a great bearing on constitution making. There is another part which is about justice, um, lustration laws, uh, what to do with uh, uh, the Ancien Regime figureheads, the people who killed at various levels, uh, the, the problem of the exactions that we have seen in the Libyan Revolution itself. Uh, this is another vast topic which I think will be with us for the foreseeable future. Uh, and will be, uh, will be operating in the various countries of the Middle East, uh, even those where the revolution has not succeeded. What I'm talking uh, today about is the constitutional moment. And but what I mean constitutional moment is uh, borrowing from my colleague Bruce Ackerman, trying to understand when there were particular moments in the constitutional history of the United States where a paradigmatic shift is taking place. Well, here we have the potential of a paradigm moving away from uh, a system of authoritarianism across the region, 
uh, to one which is a more tolerant, more liberal, more constitutional one uh, in the sense of uh, what we understand by a constitution. And I, in that particular perspective, uh, I don't enjoy passing too much words about liberalism and uh, liberal democracies and democracies. I think we operate generally within uh, a set of parameters that tend to be clear in their general traits to all of us. Uh, and to try to force them into categories um, that, that hold is not particularly helpful. Now, the constitutional moment is upon us in all the revolutions. It has one condition. It's a condition that is necessary but not sufficient. The dictator must be gone. And the dictator must be gone means the king in Saudi Arabia must go. It means the king of Jordan <coughs> must go. It means the Ayatollah up there in his religious dictatorship must go. Um, I don't make exceptions. I don't think that there is a fundamental exception in the authoritarianism that we see in republics and that we see in monarchies or in this always footnote of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, only then is the constitutional moment possible. It will not be possible before the dictator leaves. Now, that creates a problem, and that is you cannot erase history, and people function with a format of constitutionalism that willy-nilly they accept, and it would be a mistake to think that the Middle East does not have constitutions. Even those very unpleasant constitutions that the Middle East has uh, form a pattern of ruins if the revolution succeeds that you simply cannot ignore. And so to the extent that you want to have a constitutional moment, uh, whether you want it or not, these patterns are going to be part of your, to borrow from Freud, some sort of an unconscious uh, of your political imagination. Um, and so when we come to talking about Article 2, we want a new constitution in Egypt. The Egyptians want a new constitution with Egypt. And they want to assign some role to Islamic law for it. It is impossible for them to say, well, we ignore Article 2 and the legacy of the Supreme Constitutional Court in the interpretation of uh, Article 2. But let me cut short um, a chapter which I'm very um, apologetic having sent so late to my colleagues. It always reminds me. I look like a, you know, a freshman coming up with excuses, but my laptop died on me for five straight days when I was traveling and became impossible to, uh, to honor at least a minimal decency in sending the paper, so they all received it yesterday evening. So let me cut through uh, the paper and go to what I think is the most, impo the, most imp <coughs> the most difficult dimension of the constitutional moment, and one which is particularly tied to the Middle East. Let me give you this little anecdote which appears towards the end of my paper, which is, I think, some Iraqi politician, I can't remember who it was in the 60s, at a moment of great upheaval in Iraq, who is a lawyer by profession and who is being harassed by his colleagues in the party to come up with the constitution for Iraq. And he's fed up after a while, and he tells them, look, give me an agreement, and I'll write your constitution in two hours. It is not difficult to write the Constitution, right? We know the parameters. Actually, thinking about this conference, it seems to me that our constitutional imagination is absolutely limited to where it froze in 1787 uh, in this country. So you have, you know, seven articles of the Constitution plus the Bill of Rights, give and take one or two who could be, which could be uh, put in a different place in the Constitution, like uh, Article 5 on uh, judicial supremacy can go into uh, Article 4 about uh, Article 3 about, uh, about the courts. But think of it. You cannot retract a single title from how it appears in the seven articles of the Constitution. And even worse, you cannot add a single title. Whatever Constitution you write anywhere will have to go through these. The separation of powers divided in three uh, and then if you want federalism or not, you add something about the states, and then you have uh, the revision and amendments, and you have when uh, the ratification takes place and the 
text is into effect. And then uh, whether you have a quirk about the Virginia um, politics that requires the Bill of Rights to be done separately as opposed to within the text of the Constitution, but there is not going to be a single Constitution anywhere in the world after uh, 1787 that varies from that format. I call it the dullness of constitutionalism. It's really dull. You, you, know, you, you teach it to your students. Where it becomes less dull is when you have foundational moments when you start questioning a few important elements. And let me finish because I promised that I would uh, do it in 10 minutes to have the greatest possibility of interaction um, with all of us tonight, tonight this afternoon. Um, let me summarize what I think is going to be the most difficult dimension of Middle Eastern constitutionalism. Um, I've written about it quite often, but in this particular instance, uh, looking prospectively, it's going to be the difficulty that sectarianism, and that is uh, used neutrally as a term, in other words, the agency of an individual towards the state slash government through his sect, religiously defined in the Middle East, this agency is the most difficult constitutional um, hurdle that all these countries have to face, all our countries have to face. And, uh, and to be a little bit less abstract. Um, the problem is that the individual, which is the basis of any constitution as a matter of uh, foundation since the Enlightenment, based on the equality, uh, is the theoretical equality of the individual um, with another individual in that community that one calls a state, uh, this is trumped by the fact that the individual in the Middle East is forced or chooses to mediate his relationship to the state through the state he belongs to, even though he might not believe in the precepts of the text. And so this sectarianism that we call Sunni Shi'i in Iraq, that we call uh, Jewish, non-Jewish in Israel, that we call Christian Muslim, and the, vari the, the, the immense varieties that you will have across the Middle East has proved to be the most difficult challenge to constitutionalism as we have received it uh, since the Enlightenment. I don't have an answer to this. I don't think there is a constitutional answer to this. I think that we have, and this is uh, something that will be decisive in the constitutional moment that all the countries that have moved from their dictator to the state of constitutional moment are going to face, how is it that they are going to remove or address uh, this problem of inevitable agency through a sect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have time for questions from the floor. Uh, our panelists have raised a number of, or have put a number of issues on the table about uh, how to design a constitution that can accommodate religious sectarianism and at the same time uh, provide for legitimate decision-making authority. Uh, I think rather than uh, hearing from them anymore, we should open it up for questions. And um, here we go, uh, right in the front. <laughs> 
Well, this in some respects, it goes to one of the phrases that Shibley said, which I, 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 I really uh, was enamored with, sort of the ruins of dictatorship. One of the ruins of dictatorship, at least in Egypt, I think is the status of Egyptian law schools, right, where they turned into sort of uh, degree mills. And obviously, one, of the, one, one reason one might say that the Sanhuri project failed or did not succeed to the extent that he uh, envisioned it could was it really requires a lot of the legal class because they have to know, I mean, essentially he wanted everybody to become a comparative jurist, right? And this puts a lot of weight on legal education. And in his day and age, legal education was sort of an elite project and subsequent to the revolution in Egypt in 1952, it became very much of something something else. Now, I don't want to come off as an elitist, right? Maybe, maybe common law tradi uh, tradition is more elitist than civil law in the sense that it requires more, um, you know, uh, more training in the, the legal practitioner in terms of the ability to reason through precedent, et cetera, et cetera, instead of just finding a clear rule and applying it. Um, so I, I don't know how to do it, <laughs> so to speak. But clearly, among the things that are going to have to change is uh, uh, legal reform, education, uh, legal education reform, to create a more discursive tradition of, of law learning. I'm, I'm sure you could do it somehow in civil law. I'm not, I'm not talking about a wholesale replacement. I'm talking about sort of a change in the way that we deal with law and interact with it, instead of just a command coming from on high, but something that we interact with, that we interpret actively, that we engage with and we demand reasons and justifications for. I think that's got to be part of a democratic transition, whether you call it liberal, Islamic, or anything, right? Something that gives agency to the people as users of the law, not just its objects. Can I just follow up on one? The, um, I, I, think that's, I think that's all right. Not just all right, it is all right. Actually, it's, it's entirely correct. Um, one thing that one has to remember that there's a, there's a double problem because I, because turning something into a, a common law versus a civil law, although, although I think that might be might be very productive, it is in fact extremely hard. The the, the twin problems that that Egypt had is that it it not only lost a class of people that Sanhuri had expected, in fact, to be able to develop even to find more gaps and develop within the gaps. So you lost that legal ability to legitimize the law, but the law itself ceased to be created through a democratic mechanism. Yeah. So that you neither had discourse in the courts that was meaningful, nor did you have discourse in the political sphere that was meaningful. And so the law suffered a, a twin drought of legitimacy. And, and I should have prefaced the idea, my, my comment that non-justiciability of, of, of a Sharia provision cannot legitimize the state in a dictatorship. That's the, that's the quirk. It is only as a product of the Arab Spring that this can become, once again, a reasonable provision. In the text, I, I go through the history of, of these Sharia clauses, which were, are all non-justiciable at the beginning, and stop being non-justiciable because the people refuse to accept it. They say, if, if I don't trust you, then, and you're just a dictator saying what it, it is what you want, then I don't trust it. Once we move to a democratic scheme, then it is possible that, that the code will become legitimized in Islamic terms, not because judges are engaged in that discourse, but because politicians are. And so the hope, although it remains only a hope, is that actually by bringing the Muslim brothers and Salafis who have very different views of Islam, and liberals who have a under-theorized but nonetheless have a view of what Islam requires, and having them in a parliament may create discourse in the parliament rather than the courts that will legitimize the, the code. 
rights and freedoms of the Fiscal Court of Human Rights. Uh, and I say that fully aware of the fact that a lot of what people consider to be Sharia law, granting unequal rights to women, is really not based upon legitimate uh, interpretations of Sharia law, it's really based upon custom and tradition. But that being said, it's the interpretation of the Sharia law, not the actuality, that really matters. If it's being interpreted that way, it's being applied that way, and that's what we have. Can I take a crack at this? Is this okay? Uh, yes. <laughs> Not because I have an answer, but because I feel like I have to, since I brought up some issues. Um, I mean, I, I, I would question the premise where you said that some Muslim or Arab or North African countries have guaranteed equal rights to women in their constitutions. I mean, there might be lots of, this is getting to uh, Chukralu's point about parchment barrier type situations. There might be declarations affirming equal rights. Um, I don't think any state, including Tunisia, would satisfy you know, modern liberal conceptions of what equal rights and gender means. Now, having said that, Having said that, um, I'm going to sort of try to say what you know Arab Muslims might say in response to that. I am an Arab Muslim, so, uh, but I mean I grew up here. But one of the problems is is that I think equality, especially in gender, remains deeply contested. Okay, a lot of people in the Arab world don't necessarily accept the idea that formal equality is the standard by which they should be measured. So that question, the standard by which equality should be measured, remains um, controversial in the Arab world. I'm not coming to saying which standard is right, but um, it's just the reality that a lot of people, men and women, don't think that formal equality is the proper measure of gender equality. That's what a lot of people will say. Um, and so they think, for example, um, that differential access to divorce isn't necessarily a huge problem. Now, when I think of issues of gender, I think the proper way, and this is purely prudential, not philosophically justified, um, is that uh, I try to listen to women's groups on the ground, right, and let them take the lead on what are the most important issues uh, to be fought for, right? And obviously, uh, gender discrimination is a huge problem uh, in the Arab world, right? And it needs to be uh, fought. I just don't think the most prudential way of fighting it is to attack Islamic law. Okay. Mr. Chowdhury. So along the same lines, uh, religious minorities and, and, and Sharia supremacy laws, and this is the, sort of the discussion I'd like to get going between you and Chibli. But so Chibli's making a call for not non-sectarian form of constitutionalism uh, in the Middle East. And, and one of the criticisms of Article 2 uh, is that it, it, it might underwrite and even legally justify uh, differential treatment of religious minorities in Egypt, for example. And so how do you, I just want to get the two of you in a, in a, in a, in a discussion about the issue of, of non-sectarianism and its, its, its relationship to Sharia supremacy. It's a big subject. As I said, I think the more difficult dimension is to, um, when I say non-sectarianism, is that what, what, I, what I'm referring to really is that irrespective of where you uh, stand as a, as a citizen, you are the prisoner of your sect. Now, one knows it, uh, Israeli colleagues know it. The, the, where Israelis and Lebanese youth meet most often is in the courthouse in Cyprus. And that is in neither country could they have a non-religious marriage. They have no choice. They have to go elsewhere if they want to marry. Well, it's, not, it's more complicated than that. But what I think even in that case, uh, what is hiding behind that great problem of having to go abroad to marry in a non-sectarian, non-religious way is that you can't do politics in your country by just not being a Shia or not being a Christian and not being a Sunni. It's forced upon you. There's a great, um, there's a great anecdote uh, that goes back to the 30s. You know, Saad Zaghloul was a wonderful, extraordinary 
um, revolutionary. Um, fighting the British, uh, in, in, in my view, far more successfully and, and poisonedly than Gandhi did. Um, and his partner in the battle uh, was Makram Abed, who was a Christian Copt. And at one point in the 20s, Parliament had been authorized by the British, and the question was whether you would have a quota for Christians in Egypt, so as to defeat the majoritarian um, the majoritarian tyranny of the vote. And Makram would absolutely refuse this, on the basis that I'm Egyptian, I'm not Copt, I'm Egyptian first, and once you start on that downhill road of the quota, it's over for my citizenship and my equality with Saad Zaghloul and our leadership of that revolution. Well, look at where was Egypt is now. I mean, it's only on some sort of a sufferance that you have a Copt in parliament. Uh, so that, that, that creates a real question. Do you need to be sectarian and defy, defend your sectarianism in order to claim your place in the sun, in the constitutional sun of your country? And that's why I'm done, I don't have an answer. I think majoritarianism and, uh, and majoritarianism as defining notion of democracy has always been problematic, right? That's why you have federalism. Federalism is a way to undermine majoritarianism geographically so that the guy who votes in Rhode Island, in effect, has 50 times more power of vote uh, than the guy who votes in California. So I tried, I tried to instill feder, feder, federalism to solve the sectarian quandary in Iraq, which is actually additionally a, national, a nation, uh, an ethnic quandary, right? So you have the Sunni Shia problem in Iraq where people define themselves as Sunni and Shia even if they don't know the difference between Sunnism and Shias. Right? Uh, and the Kurds on top of this. The problem is that organizing geographical federalism to solve a personal sectarian problem does not seem to work that well. Although I think it's a way forward. So I, I don't have an answer, but to link it to the Article 2 of the Constitution, I think both Muhammad and Clark have exhausted the subject. Um, you know, there are going to be courts, some enlightened, as in, uh, the court of Awad al mur some in Supreme Constitutional Court uh, uh, towering figure who died in, uh, in 2004. Um, you can't always have a Sanhuri or Awad al mur on this, but you can have you know, a thuggish judge being appointed there. Um, so th there is no particular mechanism. What I would say would be an interesting mechanism, I don't know if there's anything novel about this, and it ties down ties in a question that Professor Fardel raised. Why is it that despite all his efforts, uh, Sanhuri's civil code doesn't jump at you at, as Islamic? In other words, put it in other words, doesn't jump at you as authentic. Right? It's not, people in Egypt don't relate to the civil code as if it was one, they don't recognize the language. So maybe the emphasis should be on the language. I haven't given up on this. I tried to do it with the Iraqi Revision Constitutional Reform Committee uh, to say, well, is there a way that we can use the legal tradition of Iraq in order to come up with a Bill of Rights that it's not translation of the Universal Declaration or indeed of the... And of course the question is guided. And the answer is, well, we have to look into our tradition. What is it that puts, for instance, uh, the role of courts as protectors of the citizen, or the role of law as a protector of citizen and not a tool of power? And if you look carefully enough and you look at it with, a, with a, an imaginative and sometimes scholarly twist of the mind, you'll find it in Hammurabi. The preamble of the code of Hammurabi says that the reason why God Hammurabi has given, God has given Hammurabi this law is to protect the weak. The protection of the weak by the law is something that you can find. So if the Egyptians, if the Iraqis use this as 
a fundamental article in their Bill of Rights, they will recognize it much more easily than if you take it from, if they take it from uh, um, some amendment uh, of, of, of the American Constitution. So the reason I think, Muhammad, that uh, Sanhuri's code does not jump at you as an authentic Islamic code is because of its style. It's the language. Uh, and we have a beautiful counterexample. Nobody ever questioned uh, the fact that the Majalla was an Islamic law document. Okay, the Majalla was passed between 1871 and 1876 by the Ottoman Empire. Interestingly, Arabic language with the Ottomans putting it forward. You read the Majalla, it jumps at you as, I would say, unauthentic. This is my tradition. I recognize the words in the Majalla. I go to Sanhuri's code, it sounds like a translation of, uh, of Cambaceres, right? So, uh, so my sense is that this is where we haven't done enough work, that maybe the way forward, rather than put it in Islamic law terms, black and white, where as a Christian, I am not ready to accept in my constitution that uh, Islamic law is the law of the land. The hell with it. Islamic law as part of the law of the land, yes, and I defend it, and that's why I love Islamic law. It's part of my tradition. But to put it as a segregator of citizenship is a catastrophe. And I'm not going to give it, and my colleagues in Egypt are not giving it. And we might be wrong this time. No, we'll continue fighting for this, because that's why we have we'll been fighting against Mubarak. So uh, behind the pathos, the technical dimension, I think, has to go back to this issue of sectarianism. And we have to think it through. We don't have an answer. The Israelis don't have an answer. Um, and I'm not talking about the legacy of, uh, of African Americans. Um, there is no s easy answer in majoritarian constitutionalism to all these issues. We continue to fight it. We recreate it all the time. In the Middle East, it's particularly difficult because there is no subordination by principle. In other words, um, the Christians in Lebanon uh, dominate technically the executive, right? It's unacceptable for a Muslim. Now, how do you solve it? If you have a situation where a Muslim is there and there is no possibility for a Christian to become president, of course the Christians are not going to accept it. So there is no solution. I'm just pointing to a very serious problem. On Article 2, my sense is that we have to reclaim the language. And this is where constitutional advising has to be imaginative. You can't do it uh, shorthand. You know? It's very easy. You take to any one of us and uh, can write a constitution in an afternoon. <laughs> Did you want to yeah. come in yeah, briefly just on that? Quickly, I agree with most of what Shibley says. But just one amendment to your question. Article 2 is not a Sharia supremacy clause, right? It's not like the supremacy clause in the federal constitution, right? Um, at least that's not the way the Supreme Constitutional Court has read it. And I think, um, you know, Barbara Johansson has a very good article on this in which he <laughs> says that um, the Supreme Constitutional Court has always taken the position that Article 2 is one of several constitutional commitments that must be mutually reconciled. And I think that's actually the right reading of Egyptian history, uh, that Islamic legal modernism has been about reconciling Islamic legal history with post-enlightenment values, right? It's not a question of displacing post-enlightenment values with pre-modern Islamic law, right? Now, on the other hand, that doesn't mean that everybody in Egypt is on board, and we're going to see how it's going to work out. Now, I just wanted to say something about how do we go forward. Um, I'm a little bit more optimistic <laughs> about how to go forward. Um, you know, the very fact that in the 1920s, Makram Obeid was the most popular, or 1930s, the most popular Egyptian pop, uh, politician, tells you that I don't think sectarianism is um, in the set, I mean, is always has to be there. Um, I think for one thing, the reason why sectarianism is so pervasive in Egypt today is because of uh, the policies of first said that, and then more so Mubarak, who cultivated uh, sectarianism quite intentionally. I think, uh, at least my hope is, um, 
it may be too ambitious to have a liberal uh, constitution today in Egypt. But I think it is perfectly possible to get a constitution that restricts gov arbitrary government power, that uh, protects um, you know, a, a, a decent core of individual rights, that enforces non-discriminatory uh, application of the law and rights, all of which, in theory, are already there. Right? Nobody, it would not, it's, nobody's going to stand up and say that it's okay to discriminate against Christians in Egypt. I mean, that is a value that is, has been gone for 100 years in Egypt, but we know that the law is not effective in Egypt, right? Um, and so uh, I think the trend of Islamic law interpretation in the last 150 years has been to try to make it less sectarian rather than to emphasize sectarianness in it, right? The problem is the Egyptian state has not been very effective in carrying out this mandate. And the hope is that with a, you know, a partially democratic state that is held accountable to the Egyptian people, right, um, that uh, Egyptians, whether Muslims, Christians, non-believers, or whatever, uh, experience cooperation together in civic institutions, that they can restore a sense of citizenship that trumps uh, sort of sectarian identity. I just, I don't think sectarian identity is, is an essential attribute. I think it's, a, it's an attribute of a particular configuration of institutions. So if the institutions can be improved, I think we can make progress over sectarianism over time. At least that's my, my hope. Uh, question over there, actually. Um, you're talking about in Egypt? Well, for example, issues of custody, child custody, issues of, um, uh, of having um, parental, uh, con I, I, not just custody, because there's, there's, I guess, I don't know the technical terms in family law, but custodial care as well as um, being acting as full plenary guardians over children, um, issues in employment, etc. Um, I, I just don't think that frontal assaults on Islamic law are the way to move forward. I think you can get a lot more consensus on discrete issues, right? But once a sort of frontal assault on Islamic law is made as such, it ends up creating more resistance than is required for the problem to be solved. Can I say that one thing, though, that women complain a lot when I talk to them is simply about the slow pace and the inefficiency of justice? I know that sounds weird, but, but I, the, 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 the basic problems with the, with the legal system in, in enforcing rights that are technically on the books already, structural problems, are of enormous concern because the delays uh, and the cost of delays to, to women are overwhelming. So that's... We shouldn't lose sight of those things, too. Can I just uh, interject there, not with a question, but uh, more of a comment, which is that as someone who's not a constitutional lawyer, uh, I'll, do, um, I'll, I'll say this um, with some trepidation, but I'm, I'm left wondering after listening to you all how important you think constitutional law actually is. Um, because it seems clear that you don't think the text of the constitutions is terribly important. Um, I think I haven't heard from any of you that the actual words matter that that much. Uh, from Mohammed, uh, it seems like the judicial culture is the critical variable. Um, from Clark, you're focusing more on the institutions that interpret the constitution or more generally institutions that administer the laws and th their structure. But those are and structured by the constitution. And it's at that level that it's really important. So it may be the structural provisions as opposed to provisions like Article 2 or any of the rights granting provisions then. It, that, in that in the Article 2 context, it's the important thing is the institution, the structure okay. of the institution that So it's the it. structural provisions which may be constitutional. And then perhaps the politics. Is that the, where, where we are? Because I, I'm just trying to figure out how much attention, uh, if, if you say you're interested in constitutional design, how much attention should we be paying to the, uh, the actual text of the, the substantive provisions, or should it be about these structural provisions, designing the institutions, the judicial culture, the linguistic style, uh, or just the funding for the courts? So that's, 
where I am so far in terms of the, um, the discussion. But uh, let me... You know, there is, whether we want it or not, we have deadlines. Now, the deadlines are pressed upon by, by politics, and one has to deal with it. We didn't talk, for instance, about all right, a very important dimension that we didn't allude to mention at all, but I'm sure it's in the back of all our work in, in the field, is, well, as the Egyptians put it in or around June 2011, what comes for fir first, elections or the Constitution? And then you have variations. You could have elections um, of a National Assembly that is constituent and only secondarily that works as a legislator. In other words, what happened in Tunisia as opposed to Egypt is our wonderful, brilliant colleague, Professor Ayad Ben Ashur, was entrusted with administering, you know, parallel to see the choices that have a lot of consequences. So SCAF comes to power in Egypt, um, removes Mubarak, and assigns the amendment of the Egyptian constitution to a committee of 11 or 12 headed by a very good lawyer called Tari al Bishri. Same time, more or less, whoever is in power generally in Tunis is assigning Professor Ayad Ben Ashur, a constitutional professor in Tunis, to organize the elections. So in other words, to pass the law that will allow the elections of a new assembly free of Zain al-Abdin. Bishri finishes his work in 10 days, 12 days. It was exhilarating. And I think what he did was something that was asked from him and one thing that he did extremely well, uh, that is, you look at the Constitution of Egypt, I think there are about 150 articles. 90% of the articles are fine. You have one article, which is a catastrophe, is Article 76 on the candidacy to the presidency. All right? You change that and you free the presidency from the shackles that you had before. The question is, people were saying, why a small committee? Why are we not involved? This is our revolution. We want our constitution. So there's a sort of mass psychology dimension about it. So I don't think that, yeah, we can give some distance to, uh, to the constitution and some leeway and some relativization. But I don't think we can, as we say, we say in French, make the economy of the constitutional debate. It's upon us and it's so charged that we can't just remain silent and we have to be engaged because all these people are engaged. The battle every day in Egypt, in Tunisia, about, is about the Constitution. How, who is represented in the committee to, to, to write the Constitution? Is it enough? Are, are, are there enough women? One of the greatest criticisms, and one of the fundamental reasons why the Bishri Committee failed, despite what I think was a good result, was one, an unfortunate mistake that they made, and second, the fact that there were no women on the committee. In a, even in the Middle East, the sense that women were so important in the revolution that they dare put a committee of 12 that a woman is not, is not part of wrecked the Bishri legitimacy. So you have to, you know, you have to, to do all, of course it's politics, but it's also you know, coining words and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fact, you know, what, what uh, Sujit is embarking on is a fascinating it can be dull, of course, you just take 1787 and reproduce it. But there are a lot of elements that come in there, in the political imagination, in the historic imagination, in judicial technique. You know, you want a constitution, you want a constitutional council or a Supreme Court-like uh, system. You, know, you have to debate what the advantages are or not the advantages. You have a deadline. You have to write an article in your constitution saying, well, there is a body of judges that is going to review uh, a law on a case or controversy and see whether uh, that law is actually um, contrary to some fundamental article that they come up with the constitution. Right. How many people there? Do you need women on it? Is it necessary? Do you have clerics on it? Uh, if we're talking about reviving the tradition, let's call it traditional law because uh, Islamic law is like Virginia Woolf. Everybody is afraid of it. <laughs> Can I can I say one thing just and we'll just finish just maybe just finish up because I know where we are. I think this is why, though I, th I think constitutions are important. If they weren't, I, I wouldn't be here and wouldn't have been so happy 
to have been invited, and I wouldn't be so happy that Sue just created this, um, created this center. But they're they're sometimes important in, in in at least I think they're important in different ways. Um, institutions matter, but that's because as I see it, constitutions do something something different. They create terms, the discursive terms on which people argue about how they're to be governed, and they create the institutional framework in which those arguments take place. And institutions can be structured in a way that has those arguments be productive and leads to, to some form of consensus, or can structure them in a way that leads them to be unproductive and not, uh, not accepted. In my paper, I hope I didn't come through as saying that I prefer a world that, and that I would prefer the, the U.S. Constitution adopt a constitutional Islamization provision. That's not, that's not my personal aspiration for my own country, but that is the aspiration of many people in the Muslim world after the Arab Spring. And I think that we have to think then about the fact that if constitutions do that, then how do you structure institutions so that the discussions about what Islam requires for a state to be legitimate? takes place in a productive manner. And the quirk about this goes to a point that Muhammad and, and Shibli have raised, which has to do with the legitimacy of the civil code. The, the, one of the funny things about the civil code, although it's true that people don't see it as Islamic, is that there's been a lot of discussion in Egypt about how many provisions need to be changed. And this has become a question posed to members of the Muslim Brotherhood and to new parliamentarians. And the answer invariably from the Azhar, from the Akhwan, from the Salafis is very, very, very few. And the number bounces around. I was, I was going, uh, looking at the Salafi party, and I was stunned to see that they're recommending three, maybe four. They're not sure. They have to think about it. That's the, in, in the entire civil code. That's what it would take to render the code Islamic and the Islamically legitimate. It doesn't take much substantively, but until the state commits to engaging in that review and commits itself, to changing anything that society does find un-Islamic, then it can't be legitimized. So the process, creating a process, is crucial in order to create buy-in for a state that's going forward and for a political system that's going forward. And in that environment, I, I think it's absolutely um, essential that, that this center and all the activities that you all are taking place is done with great care and with, it, and with the real belief that it matters, because it does. Uh, last word on this. My personal view, my personal view, at least in the case of Egypt, my personal view, at least in the case of Egypt, was that um, rushing toward a new constitution was not a good idea, um, just because I think there are a host of deep ideological divisions within Egypt, and um, previous attempts at doing this have failed, and have invited the return of authoritarianism, and. I'm still concerned about that, and that's why I've much preferred focusing um, on getting good legislation to fix the very specific structural problems that I think all Egyptian groups agree need to be resolved, right? And this is sort of the problem, I think, I thought Chibli was going to allude to this in his speaking of deadlines. Egypt set itself up for a series of artificial deadlines that it needs to meet. Well, what if people can't agree? Right? And what if people can't agree that this hundred people are legitimate, et cetera, et cetera? It's gonna, it could be a disaster. However, everybody in Egypt agrees that the court system is horribly inefficient. Everybody agrees that the police, is, that the police are abusive and need to be reformed. Everybody agrees that corruption is crippling the economy. Right? And I think it would have been a lot uh, more uh, effective had the various opposition forces focused on those specific discrete issues, which were, were, after all, the things that motivated and mobilized people to go into the streets. After an interim period of five to ten years solving those problems, there would have been a sufficient pool, I think, of mutual trust developed to negotiate a much more satisfactory constitution. But right now, I mean, I think the irony is, looking from the perspective of political philosophy, like Rawls speaks about um, several constitutional moments. We talk about you know, ending a civil war, there's a modus vivendi, then we get a constitutional consensus which is relatively thin, and then broadens over time into something that we can recognize as a liberal constitution with deep roots in society. But now we're trying to get the cart before the horse. It's not, I, I just find it difficult to believe that it's gonna work, right?
we're still very much at a prudential stage. I think we should just recognize that and accept the fact that you're going to have a constitution with lots of warts and blemishes. The mo most important thing is that it encourages better, in my opinion, better, more accountable government. I think human experience has been that if you have better, more accountable government, it will evolve in good directions. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies to those who uh, have had questions, but I think we're out of time, and hopefully you can uh, approach the speakers afterwards. But uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for what's been a very stimulating discussion. And uh, this one? that marks the conclusion of our symposium. Thanks again to all of our speakers, to our panelists. Uh, we have a reception outside with some tea and coffee if you want to um, join us afterward for more informal conversation. And our next event is on May the 8th. Uh, TESEV, uh, Turkey's leading think tank, is setting a delegation here. And we are hosting a lunchtime panel on uh, the Turkish constitutional transition uh, with Dilek Kurban and many other distinguished colleagues. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. You know, so, so very